Hello again. Welcome to the last afternoon session. But this is the clinical session. And we're going to start with competencies in One Health and go on from there. Again, uh, I'm Lewis Weiss. I am the co-director of the Einstein Global Health Center. Um, Jacqueline Akkar is the other co-director. Jill Ralphman is the associate director who's here, who, who you know, and our uh, partners in all this is uh, EcoHealth Alliance, who have helped to do all of this. Um, so can I have Dr. Uh, Mazet? Okay. So thank you for the organizers. I'm taking off that hat I had on before, putting on a totally different hat. Um, I'm now uh, speaking to you more in my uh, educator role, and, um, and I have the privilege of bringing to you this um, basically output from um, the National Academies uh, of Engineering, Science, and Medicine. Um, and we, I have the um, honor to be the chair of what's called a One Health Action Collaborative, which means it's like a working group of the National Academies, but it means we have products. We actually have to make products, and so that's what the Action Collaborative is. Um, and we were born out of the Forum on Microbial Threats, which is also for the National Academies. And uh, the background, I think we've had it, we've discussed it today already, all of the reasons that One Health exists is that there are these very complex challenges that we've heard about today. And we've heard about IHR, even uh, Liz Mumford gave us a good talk in global health security. And how many of you know or participated in any of the joint external evaluations? You guys know what those are? Okay, so the joint external evaluations um, were sort of a product or a precursor um, to the functional output of the global health security agenda. And many countries around the world have effectively done external and internal evaluations of their core capacities for, um, for health. And when the U.S. did its own, one of the recommendations that came out of the U.S.'s uh, joint external evaluation is that we needed a more formal One Health strategy for the country. And um, it's sort of uh, coincidental in time with that JEE occurring, the National Academies also said we need to make sure we are addressing One Health in the most comprehensive way. So we want to form this working group that became the Action Collaborative. And our first uh, deliverable out of that Action Collaborative was to look at um, the One Health education. And we started because it is the National Academies, US based National Academies, we started with US co competencies used for um, One Health training programs. And I, I guess the goal was to evaluate which programs were, were incorporating One Health at all. And then if they had a focus on One Health, how many of them are, were there? Where were they? Were they being successful? And did they have strong competency-based education? And as promised, um, we, at the same time, I think a lot of folks have been talking about, I think Liz Mumford showed all the circles all over the place. So when we think about One Health, um, certainly at Davis and um, the growing momentum is to really talk about it, not as a discipline, but as an approach, an approach to problem solving. And when you do that, the, the, almost all the definitions incorporate that concept of collaborate, collaboration. And you need to collaborate with all of the disciplines um, that are needed to solve that problem. So you're never going to put all of the disciplines up on any kind of diagram because the disciplines necessarily should shift based on the problem. They're problem-based. However, what does One Health focus on? It focuses on those problems that have an intersection among human, animal, environmental, and plant health. And I think that's why my diagram has changed. Um, we're seeing national and international recognition that the environmental sector does not adequately really define the plant sector, and that the plant folks perhaps were not coming to the table as much as they could or would if they were called out more specifically. And so now the, the, a lot of the official definitions that you'll see pull plants 
out of the environment and into their special sector. And I think that's going to be a great thing for um, food safety and food security. All right, so um, when we think about competencies, I know we have a lot of educators here, um, but just for those that maybe don't think or have to think about um, competency-based education on a regular basis, those are the specific knowledges, the knowledge and skills that are acquired through education and training. Um, and we, we state those um, at, in a way that we want to have really firm <coughs> statements. Um, so a, an example of a, a, of a core competency would be the be identify and understand the origins and determinants of health. Um, competency domains are broader. So those are the, the big umbrella that certain competencies would fall under, like health knowledge, but they're not actively stated. And that becomes a little bit more important later. Um, and so we, we're really trying to measure against the competencies. Did the learners achieve the competencies by the end of their program? All right, and, and so then we first, as, a, as the working group, we first uh, evaluated past initiatives to develop core competencies in One Health um, and did a literature search. Uh, and then we also looked at <coughs> academic degree programs in the US and tried to identify where they were, how many there were, when did they develop. Uh, and we did that through web-based search and direct communication. On my first slide, I had Ari Tagami. Dr. Tagami is a um, One Health fellow with me at the One Health Institute, and she helped to staff this um, committee for the National Academies, continues to. Um, and uh, we did set our inclusion criteria, as I mentioned, for this first um, core competency activity for US programs um, that are looking at interdisciplinary approach, linking human, animal, and environmental health disciplines. This is before we specifically called out the plant piece, but you'll see part of why we are doing that is based on the outcome. And then we wanted to see um, whether or not the degree programs that did exist uh, provide sound competency-based education and whether or not there were any gaps. So uh, for the review portion, we were able to identify several strong past initiatives that worked on competencies. There was a, a Bellagio initiative, the Stone Mountain Training Work Group, uh, the USAID Respond, and now One Health Workforce um, that all put out um, um, core competency domains, as I mentioned, goals and large uh, umbrella areas, and then a Rome synthesis that pulled those three things together. Um, but uh, what we recognized as a group was that there weren't really specific competency recommendations. There were domain recommendations. You should make sure you cover these big areas. But we weren't seeing those showing up, actually, in the competencies listed by programs that were, um, that were developing. So um, some did, but not as many as we thought there should be. The other reason that's uh, going to continue to be a challenge is there's no accrediting body, right? So if you, have, if you have a degree in public health, you need to achieve certain competencies based on the accrediting body, APHA, or, or it, it follows from medical, veterinary, all the others. But there's no one health degree accreditation, and I think we believe so far that there shouldn't be, that it should be a voluntary um, thing because it's not a discipline, right? It's an approach. So it, sh it needs to be voluntary, but that doesn't mean that we can't give very specific recommendations to what those should be. Uh, and what shocked us, I think, the most is that we were able to identify 45 US-based degree programs that had a focus on One Health. Um, so we were um, amazed. And the majority of those have emerged since 2012. So there is right there the answer that many of us ask, is One Health being adopted and moved into the real practical domain? And having 45 degree programs that with a focus on One Health tells us, yes, it is. So, um, so let's do it as well as we can. And um, so 10 of those are at the bachelor's level, 27 the majority at the master's, and then a few at the doctoral level, most of them again in schools of health sciences, but uh, one in a law school, one in an agency that I'll mention in a minute. Um, very few were putting forward any core competencies. We were able to find 14 um, schools immediately that listed them on their websites or made them publicly available, so students 
could find out what they were going to be trained in and employers could say, okay, I'm going to get these skills out of people who go to this program. Um, but uh, after contacting all of them, we were able to get another four to actually give us some. They had them printed. They actually had put them together before we called. Um, and then the others didn't have that. Um, a couple of other little just key points as part of these 45 programs that we identified is that 31 of them had some sort of practicum or a practical training as part of them that they needed to do some experiential work and that seemed to be very important. And 19 of them, um, so a little less than half, but a good majority had a big focus on communication. And if you're going to say you're training people in collaboration, it behooves you to think about whether or not you're training them to communicate with each other. So um, we thought that was pretty important to pull out. Here's where we found, uh, in which states we found programs. Some states had more than one. As you can see, it's pretty um, diversely spread across the country. And here's that timeline, all the way back to 1947, that's CDC, when they first started their program. I'm pleased to tell you that my alma mater and my home institution is the next green one in 1967 with the Masters of Preventive Veterinary Medicine that was built on one medicine by Calvin Schwabe. And then you see um, the rest developed here, but you can see that that big growth in the early 2000s and then um, sort of exploding uh, around 2011-2012. Okay, so um, if we look at uh, the topics that were well represented, underrepresented, and those that were decently represented, um, you can see that uh, plant health was really underrepresented, and that sort of um, plays to the discussion I was talking about. Strangely, antimicrobial resistance also severely underrepresented, and then the, the law and policy side also underrepresented. So that gave us some clue, because we all sit in these meetings, what have we been talking about all morning, that there's some things that we talk about a lot that are missing from our, our education. Um, Well-identified epidemiology, environmental health, and ecology. That's not that surprising. Those are integrative kind of health sector um, areas. Um, and then some of the others that, that I think zoonoses, I think most people think zoonoses are like the, the star of One Health, and only in, in less than 50% of the programs where they where there was that represented. Um, so you can certainly uh, take a look at the reference. If you Google, it's in um, National Academy of Medicine Perspectives. If you Google uh, One Health Core Competencies um, Perspectives, you'll get it. I'm not going to, Catherine offered to pass this table around to you. We wanted to save some trees, but those of you who are interested in um, the specific suggestions, recommendations for the competencies to fill out those deficiencies that I was just mentioning. Um, we did uh, take the hard work that was done by the other groups in those competency domains. We um, adjusted them slightly, so we looked at all of those domains and we came up with three domains that we thought incorporated those and also pulled in some things that were missing. Um, and so we did make the domains of health knowledge, global and local issues in humans, animals, plants, and the environment, and then professional characteristics. And then we specifically called out 20 core competencies that we recommend um, that fall under those three domains. So um, again, those are publicly available if you'd like to check them out. I think it's especially useful for those of us who do um, train individuals in One Health or are already participating in One Health um, education programs that when we do our curricular reform, we have a reference to review and potentially consider including some more competencies or, or making sure that we're doing competency-based education. And then those of you who are already doing um, are planning to start up new programs, you could think about these gaps. Um, and where the gaps are and how your program might be able to help fill out what's happening um, in the larger realm. I would like to give a little um, 
a shout out to our UC Davis plant sciences group that divided that developed our global disease biology undergraduate major with help from our team, faculty in the schools of medicine um, and veterinary medicine and engineering. And they made a comprehensive program um, at the undergraduate level. And most of these domains, and not the domains, but most of these competencies actually come from them. We adapted from theirs. It was the most progressive list we could find. And then we just added the adjustments. And that, at the University of California, was the most rapidly approved undergraduate major and the most rapidly subscribed undergraduate major. So it just took off instantly. All right, um, so we also made some voluntary recommend, some recommendations, um, which included committing to competency-based education, um, looking at the key areas for uh, One Health degree programs, including the practical training and communication that I mentioned, and even for those programs that were considering starting up, we put in a little step-by-step -step guide um, for that. Next steps, um, we really hope that we can now take this a little more global. So we'll be looking and um, we're putting out, we actually have out right now, I know that's a horrible link, but it's sort of how Qualmetrics works. So yes. Catherine, I don't know if you can distribute the link to the folks who registered for the conference, but we would love it if you would take the survey. If you're in a, a One Health um, program now, it will take you about five minutes. If you happen to be in one and or had completed one and or are employed and or are also an employer, you'll have more modules, so it might take you more minutes, but I have all those things and it, it took me less than 15 minutes. Um, this will help us see where, whether or not these competencies are correct. Are we using the right ones? What are people missing, the employers? What do they wish their One Health workers had? Um, do we need to adjust the competencies? But also, um, which ones are being used by the people that are going through programs? And then also broadening it to the international realm. And then just a, another little plug for One Health Education. It doesn't have to be a new degree program. We're, we're sort of approaching it in a multi-factorial way, and one of those is by doing a summer institute or a short course that builds off the previous EnviroVet program that was from the University of Illinois and Davis and Tufts and others. So um, if you have students and or early career professionals that like more One Health training but can't leave their current jobs or, or plans, it's a one month, month course. This year will be in Tanzania. Thank you. So on to uh, more clinical practice, uh, event reporting, the power of data in medicine through a One Health lens. Dr. Madoff. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, it's really a pleasure, and thank you for, for persevering. Um, and I really want to thank uh, Einstein for, for hosting this, uh, this, this day's work, and also um, my colleagues and collaborators at EcoHealth, um, Catherine and Billy, um, for, for, for hosting this, which is tremendous. Um, so I'm, I, I came from a, a recent conference uh, where Frank Berta uh, opened the conference by saying that we shouldn't look at One Health solely through the lens of emerging infectious diseases. And I applaud that, but I'm about to do just what he uh, <laughs> said not to do, which is really to look at, at, at this through, um, through that lens. I just came from um, a meeting that our organization sponsors, um, the, the International Meeting on Emerging Diseases, which was just um, held a couple of weeks ago in um, Vienna, Austria. And it's a very One Health um, oriented meeting. Um, it, it's, it's a meeting that really attracts um, people across disciplines from the environmental health sector, from the veterinary side of things, and, uh, and, and also from the human um, health side and human public health side. And so my, my opinion is actually that, that since One Health is an approach to problems, you need to have a problem to focus on. You need to have, and, and the problem that I've chosen to focus on, my, the problem I've chosen to focus my career on is, is, is in infectious diseases and emerging infectious diseases. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about, about emerging infectious diseases, how we've come to recognize them, about how we use, um, how, how ProMed uses event-based surveillance and, and a One Health approach to event-based surveillance to monitor um, emerging infectious diseases, why we do that, 
and um, then give you some examples of, of, of some of those um, diseases and some of the ways they've been reported in um, ProMed. Um, I'm also um, going to take the prerogative sort of, 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 of gray hair and the, the long um, lifespan in this, in this field. I was talking uh, to um, Professor Weiss uh, at the, one of the breaks about how we had both um, been looking for um, academic medicine fellowships around the same, the same time, which is to say back in the, in the 1980s. And so I'm going to take us back there um, for a minute. Um, Saturday was, uh, Saturday was World AIDS Day, actually. And um, this, for, for many of you will recognize, was, the, was really the first report of, um, of HIV AIDS. It was a recognition of a cluster of pneumocystis pneumonia occurring um, in gay men in, in San Francisco, or Los Angeles, I guess. And uh, this, this disease was first recognized when it appeared um, you know, in hospitals in the US, essentially because um, astute observers, we talked about astute clinicians, astute observers at CDC who um, had re were, were given requests for the drug pentamidine to treat pneumocystis pneumonia, recognized that this was occurring in a population that it hadn't really previously occurred in, um, which was, which was um, young men who didn't have um, underlying malignancy or malnutrition or other reasons to have, HIV, uh, to have um, pneumocystis pneumonia. Anyway, I, I bring this up because HIV had clearly been around for a long time then. By 1980, um, HIV had already been ravaging Africa for, for 30 to 50 years, perhaps. Um, th there are cases, um, even in the US, going back many years before 1980, and yet it had never been recognized. And I think there are some reasons behind that, and that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit. I think one of the reasons was probably attitudinal. Um, and this, um, th th this was, has been attributed to William Story, who was a Surgeon General in 1969. And I'm not sure that he said that. There's not any really, this, ca this can't be fact checked. As, um, and, and so this may or may not have actually been said. But it certainly reflected an attitude that was prevalent at the time that infectious diseases were a solved problem and that we didn't really need to work on them. Bob Petersdorf, who was the chief of medicine at the hospital where I worked for many years, the uh, Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston, also really thought that infectious diseases were vanishing and couldn't figure out what infectious disease docs were going to do with their, uh, with their future careers. Um, and you've seen, this, uh, you've seen this graph already from uh, Ramanan. And, and, and you, so, so this is the reason that, that, people, uh, that people fought this, because there had been a pretty monotonic decline in infectious, disease, um, in infectious diseases in developed countries, and that as vaccines and antibiotics came along, that um, really we weren't going to have to worry about this anymore. We could turn our attention to important things like heart disease and cancer, and, um, and that infectious diseases were a solved problem. So, of course, it didn't work out that way. And another quote is that uh, past performance is not always tell us what's going to happen. The past is, is not always a predictor. And so by, by the early 90s, um, the, the, the pendulum had swung back. And people like Josh Lederberg, who probably um, wrote this, these words in the um, original um, Institute of Medicine, now National Academy of Medicine report on emerging infectious diseases, recognized that, that microbial diseases were going to be with us for a long time and unlikely to go away. Um, I want to talk about um, the kind of surveillance that, um, that, that ProMed does. And um, ProMed is the program for monitoring emerging diseases. I'll talk a little bit more about it later. Um, some of you are probably aware of it. But this is, this is the traditional public health system. And I spend a large part of my time working in, in traditional public health um, in the Massachusetts Health Department. Um, I'm a medical director and director of our epidemiology programs. And so I, I, I sit somewhere you know, between here and here, I guess. But it's a very hierarchical um, system where information kind of feeds from practitioners or from laboratories through um, uh, departments of, of health at various levels, and then eventually gets communicated up to world bodies, gets communicated sideways sometimes. Um, 
And, and this, is a, this is a very powerful system in many ways. Um, it is robust and sensitive and um, counts cases in a quantitative way. But it can also be slow. It takes time for information to wend its way through the system. Um, there are incentives for not reporting on diseases, and we see this all the time. Um, it, we see it in um, developing countries where, where disease outbreaks or, um, can affect tourism and trade. We see it in developed countries. Uh, we see it in states like Massachusetts where the governor's office doesn't want us to release information on eastern equine encephalitis because it, you know, it sounds bad. It's not a good, good thing, and it just doesn't want, we don't want to report it. Um, you, you saw on that on that, hier uh, that hierarchical diagram how interruptions anywhere in the chain can you can lose track of of, um, of a disease. It doesn't get reported from one level to the next. It gets lost. And um, it, I think importantly, in the case of um, HIV, if there isn't a lab test, if there isn't a diagnostic box to check on the case reporting form, if there isn't a law. Uh, like the international health regulations um, that Liz Mumford alluded to earlier that says that you need to report X, Y, or Z disease, um, it doesn't get reported. There's no, nothing, there, nothing to report. And so uncharacterized or novel diseases can get lost. And also the system is expensive. So over the years, there's evolved a system of informal or event-based surveillance um, that, that, that has come into action, and ProMed is an example of, of that kind of a system. And there are others that I'll, talk, I'll mention later. But the idea of these systems is that they can, can get information from um, anywhere and report it to anyone. And uh, that includes the um, astute clinician or astute observer, any, anybody in the public, the media, who are extremely important in our, our reporting, um, you know, we have have a, you know a world full of journalists who are out there trying to discover new things and report on them, and they're they're extremely useful in event-based surveillance. Local health officials, the world world bodies, etc., can all report through an informal um, disease surveillance system. And the advantages of these in systems complement the um, advantages of the traditional public health system in many, way. it's, it, in many ways. It's fast, it's transparent, um, there aren't so many incentives for non-reporting. It can incorporate really any kind of source and it can identify any kind of event. It's relatively inexpensive compared to the traditional public health system. But it also has disadvantages. It can be inaccurate, it can be um, inflammatory, um, it isn't tends not to be quantitative in the usual sense. We don't count cases or lab reports. And um, it, it's subject to its own set of biases, which can also play into this. Uh, into this. So non-traditional information sources um, have been referred to in, in, in many ways. Um, rumors, the WHO used to circulate a weekly rumor report, which really in this setting just means unverified, um, unverified information. Um, doesn't have quite the pejorative um, sense that it has in, in everyday speech, but non-governmental sources, unofficial, off the record, unconfirmed, also unstructured data, data that doesn't um, fit neatly into a database or, or, or a chart. Um, one of the advantages of this system is the vast amount of information that's out there. This graph only goes up to 2011, I think, but, but you can see the um, vast amount of information, but the problem is, um, is, the, is the trying to make sense of it all, the so-called sipping from the fire hose problem, where you're trying to, to take this vast flow of information and, and try to make sense of it. Um, ProMed does this through human, um, through, through people. We have a, um, a, a staff that, that sift through lots and lots of information and try to, to make sense of it and try to report on it. So I'm going to mention ProMed. Program for Monitoring Emerging Diseases. It's been around um, since 1994, so about 25 years, really, from just a couple of years after the, um, the, the Institute of Medicine report. And um, it's a system of moderated emails. It's also websites and social media. And its intent is to be an early warning system for emerging disease outbreaks. Um, it has an emphasis on, on rapid reporting. 
Um, all of our reports are vetted by subject matter experts, but not peer-reviewed in the sense of a journal peer review. Um, we try to get everything turned around, information in, um, get, it, get it out within 24 hours of receipt, and we usually do that, or, or even faster. Um, and we often post so-called requests for information for unverified or unconfirmed reports. Um, it's free. It has always been free to subscribe to and free to use, and that's by intent. There are about 90,000 subscribers now, up from about 40 when it started. And um, all reports are screened and also commented on by our subject matter expert moderators. So, so all of the reports get a little blurb about what this means, where does it fit in the context, what, what, what is this report about. Um, and it has had, since its inception, an emphasis on One Health. And I'll say, just to, to turn back the clock again for a few minutes, that to back to the 1990s, ProMed actually came out of a bioweapons conference that was held by the World Health Organization. And the, the initial intent of ProMed was to detect um, an intentional use of a biologic agent, of a, of, of a disease-causing agent. And so and if you think about those agents, the agents that are often um, in, intended for misuse, biological weapons, many, most, the overwhelming majority of those are zoonotic um, agents, um, be them you know, anthrax or plague or pox viruses, et cetera. They're, they're often um, agents. And so very early on, ProMed um, endorsed, embraced One Health and has, and I'll talk a little bit about our regional networks later on. These are the, the I, so I wasn't there at the beginning. Um, but Jack Woodall, Steve Morse, who, who is still working in this field, and Barbara Hatch Rosenberg were the founders of ProMed who recognized, I think, this um, coalescence of emer the importance of emerging infectious diseases and also um, the birth of the internet, really, which, which, which gave rise to, or the widespread adoption of the internet, which allowed the rest of us to use this, this system. This is our website, um, which, which you can access if you don't want to get the, uh, the email reports as an alternative mechanism. Everything appears here. Um, uh, we, t we collaborate closely with HealthMap, uh, another um, disease uh, reporting group based in, in Boston. And uh, this is a health map of our disease alerts that appears on our page, and you can, you can look at it that way as well. Um, and uh, this is just a sample of a um, report, actually, this one talking about African swine fever um, and uh, its current um, global March <laughs> expansion. We also have a system of regional um, programs of ProMed, which are separate but um, crosstalk with the ProMed um, global list that, that um, many uh, people subscribe to, which is in English. We have, so, so the idea of these um, systems was to work in areas where, which are often hot spots um, for emerging infectious diseases, but which tend to be not as information rich um, or have poorer access to the media, to, to the internet, et cetera. And so um, there's a Spanish and Portuguese language system that operates in, in Latin America. There is a, a, a system in, in English, actually, in the Mekong um, region of, of Southeast Asia, um, an Anglophone and, and Francophone Africa network, a Russian language network that um, ties together the former um, Soviet Union countries, and a Middle East, North Africa, and South Asian um, network. And these operate quasi-independently. They have their own um, editorial policies and leadership, but with support from um, the global um, ProMed network, and that we feed each other. They use our reports and we use their reports, but they can focus on the um, things that are of interest to them and hopefully have um, closer ties to what's going on in their particular regions so that they can more quickly detect outbreaks within their regions. Um, ProMed currently is about 60 people in 37 countries, uh, operates really almost entirely virtually we have a face-to-face -face meeting when we can every couple of years. Um, but these are, are where ProMed staff are, are currently um, located. And um, this helps us, I, I think, uh, keep a pulse on things and um, helps us uh, stay attuned and also maintains expertise in diseases that may not be prevalent in a particular region. Um, 
So this is an example of a disease uh, detected on uh, ProMed. Um, like, uh, like HIV, um, uh, also probably a disease that was originally transmitted from animals. And this was uh, uh, the first report that, that appeared publicly on um, an outbreak occurring in Guangzhou. And one of our readers reported on this to us. ProMed is two-way, and our readers often send information to us. And this was a report of, um, of a pneumonia that was going on in Guangzhou and what was going on with it. People are dying. I was actually the top moderator on duty at that time, and I thought that this was going to be an outbreak of H5N1, actually. I really thought that this was the much anticipated, feared outbreak of um, avian influenza that had first occurred in Hong Kong and um, was now perhaps being seen in, in, in a large human population. Um, so I. Uh, this was my, my non-comment here, as it wasn't clear what was causing this. But what we learned about a month later when um, the WHO issued a press release was that this was a, an atypical pneumonia. And this was, of course, this is the first re report of SARS um, that was occurring in, in 2003. It probably first occurred um, in, 2000, in 2002. Um, but so you look at the dates on here. This is the, the WHO press release on March 12th, but by March 5th, this disease had already occurred in Canada. So this was already, um, emergency room workers were already seeing um, this illness appearing in Toronto and having deaths and recognizing, and having it spread to healthcare workers actually. Um, and they were really only aware of it through informal channels. So through um, media like ProMed and um, who, who so, so they could stay up on what could happen. And I guess the point of this is partly um, the importance of speed, and, but, but also um, to um, lay lie to the notion that there's kind of a need to know for, for, for information in public health. A lot of times um, we think that public health information only needs to be shared with other public health officials who may need to know that information. And there was no way really to predict that um, emergency room docs in Toronto were going to need to know about this outbreak of pneumonia going on in, in uh, China and in Southeast Asia, and yet they, they, they did. Um, this is the epi curve of, um, of, of SARS, which um, eventually went on to affect thousands of people, th um, you know, about a, a large number of healthcare workers, and um, caused many deaths. But one of my points in this is to, is to um, talk about moving the curve to the left. And the whole idea of early warning for disease outbreaks is to try to move the disease, move the, the epi curve to the left. If you could detect, you know, so ProMed reported on it somewhere around here, the WHO reported on it somewhere around here. What if somebody had known about it here? Um, you know, the, the, there, was no, there was no vaccine against SARS, there was no treatment for SARS, the, the control measures were classic public health, and yet um, it could be contained, but what if it had been able to be contained here or here, and, and we could have shifted this whole curve, minimized the impact, stopped it from spreading globally. Um, so people have alluded to, the, to these numbers, but I wanted to, to mention them sort of more formally here. And this is the work of, of Mark Woolhouse and colleagues in, in the UK. Quite, this is, this is getting to be a little old now, but um, he actually categorized all of the uh, known human pathogens and noted that about two thirds of them were zoonotic. And that's where that figure you'll often hear comes from. Um, but what um, they also found was that of those, um, um, of those pathogens that were emerging, and I think we heard a definition of emerging earlier, growing in extent or growing in um, geographic range or growing in numbers, um, that, that there was a, a twofold relative risk for zoonotic pathogens relative to non-zoonotic pathogens in, in emergence. And this graph actually looks, uh, sort of spells that out even, even in, in, in a more um, um, analytic way by looking at the host range here. So in human pathogens, we're expressed here as a single host, um, the, this is the risk of emergence. But as the host range of a pathogen increases, the risk of emergence um, increases. And so this is, the, this is, I guess, a rationale, um, a major rationale 
for us to look at emerging infectious diseases through, um, through, this, through this lens of One Health. Um, another pathogen, another coronavirus, um, this time um, found by another, um, by, by an astute observer, again, not a clinician this time, a laboratorian um, working in a hospital lab in Saudi Arabia who discovered a novel coronavirus. And uh, this turned out, of course, to be the, the um, pathogen of, of MERS, the, what was later named MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus. Um, another important zoonotic disease, another um, emerging disease, one that continues um, to cause problems from, you know, up to several thousand cases now, mostly in Saudi Arabia. Um, and again, um, reported first on ProMed. And again, um, a situation where, so, so in this case, what I'm, what I'm um, showing you is that the, the following day, actually, after this report appeared, um, clinicians in the United Kingdom were treating a patient from the Middle East who had an unknown respiratory syndrome. And because they had seen this report, um, used coronavirus primers to amplify that patient's sputum and, re and identified um, a another early case of MERS and someone who had previously traveled in, in the Middle East and was being treated in a hospital in the UK. So again, um, underscoring the importance of transparency, the importance of, um, of spreading the information uh, about disease outbreaks widely, not being able to really predict who needs to know and when. And again, um, an important zoonotic disease. Um, the, the Saudi Ministry of Health, um, now having seen the report, public reports on, on ProMed of this new pathogen, um, tried, you know, release their own information. And, um, you know, I guess, as is often the case, I think are given permission by the fact that uh, that information is already out there, they can respond to it and um, post this additional information. And of course, um, MERS continued to spread and we recognize its zoonotic um, potential. Um, so, so ProMed continues to, to recognize this, uh, this importance of One Health. About a third of our staff are veterinary health specialists. We also have a plant. Um, pathologist who works on our, our service, and 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 I also want to acknowledge that others are involved in this uh, in in this kind of event-based surveillance, and these are just some of the players um, in in the event-based surveillance field. Um, we collaborate now with WHO through through GORN, the Global Outbreak and Response Network. Um, we also have memoranda of understanding with um, the two World Animal Health Organizations, uh, FAO and um, OIE, the World Organization for Animal Health, and work closely with them. We actually have a moderator who specifically liaises with those, uh, with those groups. I want to mention just in the last few minutes a newer system that we've developed um, along with, um, with these collaborators, um, Skull Global Threats Fund, which is now called Ending Pandemics. TEFINET, um, the, the global organization of um, FETPs, field epidemiology training programs, Health Map, um, and uh, this is called EpiCore, and this is a, um, a system where we can try to verify early reports by enlisting epidemiologically trained volunteers around the world. So we have the, now a couple of thousands of, of volunteers we send or, or other requesting organizations, there are now some other organizations that are part of this, can send a request for information to EpiCorps targeting individuals in a geographic region where an outbreak is thought to be occurring. And these individuals can respond with information verifying or, or refuting um, an outbreak claim. And we try this, we, we hope that this um, will get uh, more validated information out more quickly. These are some um, examples of um, recent um, cases. We've, we've published this as a review in the WHO bulletin, and uh, you all encourage you all to, to look at that. But this is a, another way that we're using this. Uh, from this paper, we reported on 730 RFIs, so uh, over 1,000 responses. And um, we used 320 of these responses, and this was up to uh, about a year ago, actually, uh, that were used in ProMed reports. 
Um, so this is just a, the final, this, this, this is a slide that a, um, a journalist actually used at the very first um, international meeting on emerging diseases when a lot of people were talking about H5N1. And um, of course, the, you know, so this is the, all us looking, looking closely for that first outbreak of H5N1 when the, the real flu pandemic came. It came from, you know, a different continent, a different species, and um, just a, a plea, I guess, to, to this group to keep, uh, to stay broadly tuned in to emerging disease events. So I will um, sum up here, and I'm not going to say this all again because I've just said it, but I want to thank you all for your attention and um, also thank um, our supporters and collaborators uh, that include um, the PREDICT project, um, Jana's group, and also um, EcoHealth and a number of others uh, that, that we've worked with, um, Olga's group at uh, the um, Harvard Global Health Institute, some of the other folks who are here, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, so we have uh, someone who has the honor of, of being the closing talk before the panel, um, Dr. Parker from NIAID. He's going to talk about translational research for emerging infectious diseases. Thank you. Well, I'll try to make this quick because I know everybody's pretty tired at the end of the day. But I'll talk a little bit about some of the activities that we're doing at NIAID. And I know Dr. Gray talked about NIAID and NIH not really being embracing the One Health concept, but I'm, I think I'm going to provide a little bit of information that perhaps we are. So NIAID, or National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, is one of the 27 institutes and centers of the National Institutes of Health. And we have a dual mandate for maintaining a robust basic portfolio um, for microbiology, infectious diseases, immunology, and clinical research. But then we also have the responsibility to rapidly respond to outbreaks, such as what, what happened uh, just recently with the Zika outbreak. And all of this is to develop new medical countermeasures. So we do this for the, um, to develop therapeutics, vaccines, vector control strategies. We also expand our research capacity, um, clinical research, our genomics platforms to actually look for these medical countermeasures. So DMID, uh, the main mission of DMID is to understand the influences of microbi microbiological organisms on health and disease. That includes anything from the internal exposures with the microbiome, uh, antimicrobial resistance mechanisms, um, emergence of new uh, infectious diseases such as Zika, MERS, and Ebola. And then having a um, portfolio for longstanding and reemerging uh, diseases such as rabies, influenza, dengue, chikungunya, TB, and leprosy. And in fact, we are responsible for a portfolio of over 300 infectious disease pathogens. And this slide, I think many people have seen this before. These are the uh, emerging and reemerging infectious diseases that. Um, as of January of, of this year, have been noted around the world. And one of those was uh, bio uh, weapon or uh, anthrax attacks and the black dot there up uh, in DC where we live. Um, but you can also see other pathogens on here with um, anything from Zika, monkeypox, antimicrobial resistance, of course, hantavirus. So one thing that I do in my work is I manage the Centers of Excellence for Translational Research, and we're very fortunate Dr. Saul Sapori was one of our uh, uh, investigators in one of those projects. These were established in 2014 to advance uh, discovery, preclinical development, production, and licensure of new or improved countermeasures. These were envisioned as mini Manhattan projects, and we, are, uh, we have them advised by a scientific advisory group of non-conflicted industrial expertise that help guide go-no-go -go decisions uh, to push products to IND or uh, later stage preclinical development. These were built on the Regional Centers of Excellence program that was established after 9-11 to respond to bio, bioterrorism threats. And the CETRs, or CETRs, 
span the breadth of research from basic research all the way to some clinical development. We've had some very nice novel products that have come out of these. Um, they fill this gap between grants, partnerships, and contracts. One of the uh, major accomplishments of our CETR program, one of the 14, was the Viral Hemorrhagic Fevers Immunotherapeutic Consortium, or the VIC Consortium. This is run out of Scripps Research Institute in uh, La Jolla uh, by Dr. Erica Sapphire, who was one of the founders of the ZMAP co cocktail. This consortium is made up of 44 laboratories in 15 countries around the world, and to date, they have identified 230 human and um, primarily human survivor monoclonal antibodies anywhere from the 1997 uh, Ebola um, uh, outbreak to this recent 2013-16 outbreak in West Africa. And they compile all of these antibodies and test them in, in similar assays to compare the antibodies and compare the assays. And what they have found was that different antibodies will attack different components of the uh, either the glyco glycoprotein, the head, the stem of the Ebola uh, molecule. Two of these uh, monoclonal antibody cocktails, uh, one, this MBP134, is a combination of two monoclonal, human monoclonal antibodies that is active against Ebola, Sudan, and Bungibugio virus. Um, what's nice about that is when these hemorrhagic fevers come about, we really don't know what the cause is. We just know it's a hemorrhagic fever. So having a broadly protective antibody is critical to, to fight those first outbreaks. The other antibody um, I'll tell you about is MBP091. These are both from MAP Biopharmaceutical. Larry Zeitlin is uh, the PI there. Uh, MBP091, uh, MR191, that's from the Nicotiana or tobacco plant originally, um, was found to provide 100% survivor from Marburg, Angola, or RAVN in rhesus macaques and guinea pigs when given five days after inoculation with a hot dose of Marburg. Both of these are advancing to phase one trials with BARDA support. Um, we've had extremely uh, good success with the development of some diagnostics that also would be a One Health uh, utility. Uh, the CEDAR at Columbia University with Ian Lipkin has developed the Arboviroplex RT-PCR diagnostic, which is able to differentiate Zika virus, dengue, chikungunya, all four types of dengue, chikungunya, and West Nile virus. Again, very critical to that first differential diagnosis of, of the disease. The Zika uh, virus diagnostic was also given an emergency use authorization to be used in the ZIP study um, for Zika vaccine. The TBD or tick-borne disease serochip diagnostic is another new one that has veterinary application as well. Um, that is able to detect eight different rickettsial viruses including at, um, uh, anaplasma, phagocytophilum, Babesia, Borrelia, Ehrlichia, Rickettsia, Powassan virus, um, all with one sample. And the vercap seq is a broadly uh, a screen that broadly identifies viral infections, and that one is being considered to be used for the current outbreak of um, flaccid myelo myelitis, acute flaccid myelitis in, in children. The backcap seq this one was just published on recently, is able to screen for all 307 known human uh, pathogenic bacteria in one sample. Has about a 70 hour uh, sample to answer time on that one, but again, very important for differential diagnosis. Some of the other centers of excellence that we have uh, work on antimicrobial drug discovery from co-evolved symbiotic communities. Uh, this is an interesting one that looks at the um, compounds on the palpebra of uh, ticks and termites and ants to see what they actually use to harvest fungi in their colonies and to extract those um, dentigromycin compounds for uh, active drug candidates. 
There's also um, immunoprophylactic strategies for in, uh, controlling enteric diseases with, with Dr. Sapori's uh, cryptosporidiosis. Um, we've had development of uh, innovative TB diagnostic platforms that are able to look at phenotypic and genotypic signatures in uh, sputum as well as other sample types. And we have nanoparticle platform adjuvants that have shown to be more effective than the current flu vaccine when given in animals. This is all in animals. So the other thing that I do is work with the Partnerships Program for Translational Research. These were established in 2003, and these are, again, very product-oriented uh, developmental activities, many times including an industrial partner. We've had 44 uh, requests for application so far. These are both biodefense and emerging infectious diseases. So far, nearly 700 awards. There are a variety of mechanisms that we use for this. Application rates, uh, success rates are a little bit better than the standard R01s. Um, these are some of the recent partnerships we've had. We use a mechanism called the R21, R33 grant, which is a a uh, milestone-driven phased innovation award where applicants uh, receive two years of funding at the R R21 phase, and those who, are, who qualify are transitioned to the R33 with a higher budget for three more years. We also have R01s, but those require a candidate product in hand and substantial industrial investment. So you can see many of these are emerging infectious disease, antimicrobial resistance, tuberculosis vaccines, and others. One specific uh, One Health achievement that I'll highlight today is uh, one that the Partnerships Program supported, and that was the development of the hendrovirus subunit vaccine that was licensed in horses. Since Hendra first appeared in 1994, it's caused some severe, often fatal respiratory diseases in horses and in humans. This is a BSL-4 agent because there is no vaccine for it. And this uh, vaccine has been shown to limit transmi transmission of Hendra virus from humans to horses. To date, there has been roughly 500,000 doses of the vaccine given and it's the only vaccine that is now available for a BSL-4 agent. Other projects in our partnerships program include the BioFire Bio Film Array. This is a nested multiplex uh, PCR. Um, they have panels for uh, gastrointestinal, myeloencephalitis, blood culture, infectious diseases, respiratory panels, and pneumonia panels. We have novel adjuvants with the ID93, GLASE, TLR4 agonist, which is a, uh, currently in phase one clinical trials for TB vaccine candidate. And the ADVAX adjuvant uh, of Delta inulin used in some of the uh, influenza vaccines. We've had a lot of work with brinsadofavir uh, which was FDA fast-tracked for uh, cytomegalovirus and smallpox, and some novel phage-based T4 nanoparticle uh, dual viral vaccines that protect against anthrax and plague. Our Centers of Excellence for Influenza Research is also uh, very uh, engaged with One Health activities. They perform surveillance at the human and animal interface, both domestically and internationally. They study interspecies transmission, uh, evolutionary dynamics, avian and, and swine viruses, and detection of emerging pathogens. Some of the uh, studies include adaptation, antigenicity, reassortment, host factors, human immune responses to vaccines. And they have so far collected over 30,000 samples, which were characterized, and many of those go on into the next uh, um, flu vaccine. Uh, Dr. Madoff mentioned MERS. Uh, I looked on the WHO website the other day, and currently there are 2,266 laboratory-confirmed cases, 804 deaths, and it's been in 27 counties, uh, countries. And, um, 
NIAID's, uh, our Division of Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, as well as the Rocky Mountain Laboratories in Montana, were critical to develop uh, animal models for this disease so that we can test some of the countermeasures to that. Um, one of those is a transchromosomic uh, bovine, which is genetically modified to produce large quantities of fully human poly polyclonal IgG. Um, this is also in a phase one, and there's a spiked protein blocking antibody, which is also in a phase one with BARDA support. Antimicrobial drug resistance has been mentioned many times today, and as we all know, I don't have to tell anyone here that this, the annual cost to this is in the billions of dollars with, you know, even more lost in productivity. Um, NIAID has a strong portfolio and, and uh, strategic guidelines for antimicrobial resistance, including uh, systems biology approaches, uh, teaching old dogs, old drugs, new tricks, um, disarming but leaving unharmed, so exploring other antivirulent strategies, uh, diagnostics to guide decision making, using phage therapies, uh, synthetic microbiota, uh, again with the C. diff, that's a big, a big issue, and harnessing the immune system with immunotherapeutics. And I'd, I'd like to just remind everyone that the um, Combating Antimicrobial Resistant Bacteria National Strategy includes in its second bullet surveillance and strengthening the national One Health surveillance efforts to combat antimicrobial resistance. Some other zoonotic disease activities, Michelle talked about um, the many hosts of mycobacteria meetings. Um, I hope you all can join in uh, March of next year. We also uh, study foodborne illness, Campylobacter, Salmonella, drug resistant. Salmonella is huge. Um, other bacterial zoonotic diseases like lepto, melodiosis, and anthrax. We offer resources for researchers, and veterinarian researchers are also welcome to use these um, uh, services. We have animal models, reagents, strains, in vitro activity, testing, therapeutic manufacturing, vaccine manufacturing. And these can span anywhere along the product development pathway, although they're not meant to take a candidate product from one end to the other. It's basically there to fill a gap for you. Um, it is free of charge. It may take a little bit longer because it is the government, but you know, we can work with you to get that done. And we've had a lot of success with in vitro assessments of antimicrobial activity, uh, biopharmaceutical production, so many of the monoclonal antibodies uh, were produced in Chinese hamster ovary cells, for example, interventional agent studies looking at tox, PK, uh, multiple animal uh, models. If we don't have an animal model, we'll get one for you. Um, we do a lot of vaccine testings up to the non-human primate. Um, and again, these services are meant to lower the risk for product developers, um, advance uh, candidate products along the product development pathway, providing gap filling services, and providing those go, no go decisions for you. Um, there are a large variety of in vivo models. The uh, leprosy reagents model in armadillo is part of one of these. Um, you know, we have everything from marmosets to macaques to bats to you name it. They're, it's pretty amazing. Uh, we also do refinement of existing um, models for different routes of delivery and screening products for FDA submission. We do some lead optimization, uh, working out the scope of the SAR for people, doing PKPD, ADME tox, um, candidate ID, all the way to phase one. And of course, we have our vaccine and treatment evaluation units that actually test vaccines in people in these uh, sites. So again, this is not off limit for veterinary researchers. If I have anything that I can advise you to do is if you want to be funded by NIAID or NIH, 
you need to be on the human side of the human animal interface but you can use the veterinary side just gear it towards the human part of the human animal interface we've had a lot of very successful projects um, that have done that okay. thanks Excellent. So first of all, I want to open it up for questions for uh, Dr. Parker or Dr. Madoff. Thanks. Hi, I'm Donald McNeil from the New York Times. Um, Larry, you, you put up slides of prominent moderators around the world, which I think there were about 60 of them, but I did have the impression that there were none in China or in Russia. I wonder if, and, then you mentioned that you're cooperating with another group, Epicor, that has 2,000 people around the world. And can you explain the relationship between the moderators and the, and the other volunteers and whether they're in places the moderators can be? Sure. Um, so we do have, the, to, to quickly answer the first part, we do have um, staff in Russia. There, we do have um, moderators in Russia. Um, China uh, um, is an area that we very much want to get into. Obviously, it's a, a hot spot for emerging infectious diseases. Um, the, we, we, and it's, a, it's something that we're pursuing, but we haven't yet cracked that barrier. Um, one of the issues actually is our website, which contains a Google map, is um, inaccessible in, in China. And you know, I think that hints at some of the other um, issues in terms of just the, the, the idea of um, people operating outside of official channels to report on emerging diseases that could be, could be problematic. Um, but I actually visited China. I actually gave a talk similar to the one I gave here to uh, a group at the China CDC and also to um, a group at the key laboratory, the, the so-called key laboratories that the Chinese National Academy of Sciences r runs. And um, they were very receptive to the idea that pe pe there are people within the health, uh, public health system in, in China that are, I think, very receptive to the idea of something like ProMed. And it's something that we want to um, pursue. Um, and, and we're working on it, but, but you're right in noting that there aren't many um, staff there, and it's partly a language barrier and partly um, maybe an ideological one. Um, in terms of EpiCorps, so uh, we were one of the founding partners of EpiCorps, but we don't run it. It's being run by the Ending Pandemics Group, um, the, the, the nonprofit Ending Pandemics Group. Um, it, it does have, um, I think that we're, we're up to about 2,400 volunteers. And these are, so these people don't work for ProMed. Many of them work in other capacities. They, they apply to become EpiCorps members. They include anybody who has an interest or, or training in health and some public health experience. And um, they're, they're more or less, um, they, they, they submit their credentials. We don't verify them in any way, but they submit their credentials. And if they meet certain minimum qualifications, they become EpiCorps members, they basically are agreeing to get an occasional email asking them about um, events in their area. They are able to respond to that using an online platform and are actually able to respond anonymously, which is a, 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 key, um, a key feature of that platform. Um, and, and many do, and we can select within using a, a, a web tool in a, within a geographic area or within a country um, for members within that region to help validate um, outbreak information. Many of them were recruited through these um, field epidemiology training programs that are operated in 57 countries, I believe, right now. And so many of them actually probably work for um, their, their government public health services. Um, anonymously, then not, so they're, protected. they're protected to some degree. Yep. Anyone else? Question? Well, I, know, I know it's late, but tomorrow, actually, there'll be some time again to so come back <laughs> with, a, with a fresh perspective, which will happen right before the, uh, the uh, view from space that we're going to get. Uh, would you like to do a little bit of a summary, and then we'll go into logistics for the Absolutely, the end. absolutely. So I think today has been a really terrific day to be able to look at um, what what One Health is and isn't. Um, one of the things that I think probably we'll need to continue discussing tomorrow is, um, uh, you know, there's a, a favorite little little. Uh, poster uh, that, that my kids, we joke about at home, it's from demotivation.com and it's a picture of this big raindrop 
you know, that's you know, one of these focused and it's about to drop and all that. And it, the little tagline is, no single raindrop believes it's responsible for the flood. <laughs> and and I, think, I think some of this that's emerging is one health is an approach. I get that. It's not, you know, we don't want to be regimented. But on the other hand, how do we do the practical things like, you know, nudging things enough on the human mm -hmm. animal side that it's human enough that it flies with an IH? Right. How do we, you know, how are we um, communicating together at, at meetings, in publications, in, um, in educational approaches, it's sort of, it's like sort of everywhere and nowhere at once. Right. Um, and so I think that's mm -hmm. one of the things that's a little bit, that's a little bit difficult when you're um, trying to, you know, as a researcher, when you're trying to explain it to somebody outside of that normal realm, um, it, it's a challenge. And so I think that's one of the things that I'm, I'm excited as we continue discussions tomorrow with, um, you know, what this looks like and, and how you go about um, developing it, um, you know, I do want to, I, um, it's, there are a lot of resources that have been developed here that I personally have benefited from. I, I, I had wanted to ask you on your, um, on ProMed mail where you've got the little, the, the bit towards the end of the email, all the emails that's the background. Mm -hmm. Is that just sort of a standard database? There, I, I can't tell you how many times I've cut and pasted that and sent that to <laughs> someone. It's like, look, this is like the best explanation. That's right. It's going to take you 10 lines to read it and you're going to get it. Um, is that something that you've that's you build over time or have a database that you go to no um, no that I you know I guess that's a that's kind of our secret sauce that's uh -huh. that's the um, ex the expert uh, moderators okay. that's their you know there's uh, I have so much respect for them they they spend a, a lot of time yeah. and effort working on promed almost all of them have a, a day job mm -hmm. we give them a, we, we promed pays a very modest stipend to their mm -hmm. moderators and um, they, they do this sort of in their spare time yeah. and with great devotion. And um, many of them have a great deal of expertise in, in the topic that they're addressing. Um, you know, for example, we have an anthrax moderator, yeah. Martin Hugh Jones, yeah. who's been doing yeah. anthrax work for you know, probably 60 years now. Yeah. And um, you know, so his, his comments on anthrax are, are you know, extremely insightful and try to encompass the background. They, we, we don't always win mm -hmm. on that front some some are better than others yeah. and and some comments are you know are repeated obviously yeah. they're the yeah. same you know the same um, comment can be repeated but but no those are are, are hand hand written hand yeah. handcrafted thank and, you for and I think that's the power of, of any of this is being able to put things in context and and having that background and I think that's the you know understanding you know what's happening with disease or uh, I, I think that's a really a really key thing. Um, so I think tomorrow and being able to figure out how we you know uh, you know what what, what 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 this would look like for each person or each great. thing is great. So uh, tomorrow, as I said, the view from space followed by the view from <laughs> the medical school curricula. Uh, tonight. Are we done with making comments? Uh, would you want to make one more comment before we leave? <laughs> So how can I not give you the, the almost penultimate work? So uh, it's too bad that Dr. Zet has left because she presented a yeah. very nice summary of where we are at in relation to uh, One Health Core competency in the United States. She made a reference to the work that we've done and the response in Southeast Asia and subsequently in Africa, where we were working with the different countries identifying the core competencies and we divided them into two. There were the technical skill sets and the soft sets. But what was surprising, which the comment I wanted to make, is we weren't doing it at home here in the United States. And she made a point that actually until 12, 2012, it, this wasn't really something that was actually was uh, even uh, uh, considered or instituted in the United States. So we're doing it overseas. We weren't doing it at home. Which brings up one of those things I love to say about how things in global health really should be bi-directional. And that's, I think, an example. And with that, thank you very much for coming, and onward to libations. Thank you.